Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? All right. Uh, as you clapped before I got started, I couldn't help but think of what uh, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen used to say. And he, am I the only old person that remembers <laughs> Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen? He said, he used to say, applause at the beginning of a talk is an act of faith. <laughs> and then he said, applause in the middle of a talk is an act of hope. <laughs> now, you can imagine, as he said, at the end of a talk, if it's outstanding applause, it's a great act of charity. So I, I thank you for that initial applause. And uh, Ron, thank you so much for the, uh, uh, not only the invitation, but also the wonderful warm welcome. I appreciate that very much. You know, um, I have to say this. Uh, this is my second visit to Franciscan University. This is not my talk, by the way. Um, I just, as a pre-talk. I, I, am, I am really impressed. I was here probably 15 years ago to give a mass have a mass with uh, those who were involved in kind of pre-theology. They were considering the possibility of the priesthood. And uh, I was impressed then, but uh, meeting so many of you who are here, and then uh, listening uh, to the witness of Shannon and uh, Jeff, I, I was just so impressed by the witness that is given here. Uh, don't you agree? Thank God for the presence of Franciscan University. So I told you that I come from Louisville, Kentucky, and you know we have a little horse race there every year. Are you familiar with that? I go to the horse race, I go to the Kentucky Derby every year. I'm in my ninth year as Archbishop, and I think I've been at eight. And uh, this is, uh, this past year was my most successful. I lost only $13. It's <laughs> so about three years ago, and by the way, I go in my collar. About three years ago, I got on the elevator to go up to the seat that I had. I was on the elevator, a man was on there, a man uh, looked at me, he looked at my collar, and he said, Father, are priests allowed to bet? And I don't know why I said this. I said, well, I think we're allowed to bet, but we're not allowed to win. <laughs> and, and like this, the man said to me, you know, I believe I may have a vocation. That, now, many, many people are going to say to you, when you hear preachers talking, they'll say, now that's a true story. That actually is a true story. <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, but I do want to talk to you about vocation. Because you're catechists, and you're all in different levels of what it means to be a catechist. Many of you come with great experiences. I know that. I've always liked to teach. When I first was ordained a priest, I was assigned to a high school. It was probably the hardest thing. I don't think I was all that successful, to be honest with you. And I thought, gee, maybe I'm just not cut out for this work. I don't mean a priest. I meant uh, cut out to be a, a catechist or a teacher. So I know it's not easy to teach. And I thank you because if the world ever, ever needed catechists who are formed and committed in love and truth, and I hear this at Franciscan University all the time, not just love and not just truth, but both. We need people who are willing to be evangelizers of both. So I thank you for being formed. You're serious about it or you wouldn't be here. Now, I noticed that, um, that Ron, when he introduced me, he started with when I was ordained a priest. Did you know I actually lived before that? <laughs> and I want to talk to you about that, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why when I was, I was 25 when I was ordained a priest. But I want to tell you, tonight I want to talk to you about a very unique part of reaching out in mercy, and that is the capacity for you and me to enter into the presence of another person. Now, obviously, where I'm going with this is studying the Gospels. 
Because if you want to know how to enter into the life of another person, study Jesus. But the truth is that if we don't enter into the life of another person, what we say will not be heard. You, understand, you, you agree with that, don't you? I think it was, um, it was the great Cicero. And by the way, um, before I quote Cicero, let me quote George Burns. Any of you remember George Burns? George Burns was asked, he's, he was asked, how, how would you characterize a good homily? And he said, well, now, first of all, I'm not Catholic. But he said, if, since I'm asked, I will let you know. He says, I think a good homily begins with uh, a, a very sharp beginning. It ends with a very powerful ending, and it has very little room in between. <laughs> so that's not this talk tonight. <laughs> Cicero, here's what he said. You know, Cicero was the great orator from, from uh, the, the glories of Rome. And he said, a great speech teaches, delights, and sways. He said, to teach is a necessity. To delight makes all agreeable. But to sway brings victory. This is important for us who are wanting to be Catholic. Teach is a necessity. He's not saying not to teach. To delight makes all agreeable. People will not listen to you if you're boring. And I, I hope I don't prove that tonight. But to sway, you know what we would say, to bring about conversion, to change hearts. To, sh to change hearts brings about victory. I'd like to talk to you about the art of accompaniment. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, says that the first act of mercy is to walk with another person. Now, we know we walk with them in love and in truth. We need to lead people somewhere. We don't walk in circles. But to we begin by walking with another person. I never use the phrase accompaniment in my life, I don't think, nor the art of accompaniment. But guess what? When I was ordained a priest in 1972, the very priest that I looked around and saw and thought, you know, I want to be like that priest. You know what I'm talking about. If you've, if you've been desirous to be a catechist, you look around and you say, boy, this, this is my mentor. Even if, if I don't ever talk to this person, I'm going to watch what this person does and imitate what they do. Well, that's how I was as a young priest. I thought, I want to be like this priest or that priest. And you know what was good about them? They were, not, they were no nonsense. They, they preached the truth. But they always had a capacity to join people, to, to befriend people. That's why I like the Chrysia where it said, remember it says, make a friend. Am I the only one who knows that one? Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. Jesus, in all the gospel passages, if you remember, I think it was a John 1, where Andrew is following Jesus. Jesus turns around and and he says, what are you looking for? And I think uh, Andrew was Irish because he answered the question with another question. <laughs> and he said, Lord, where do you live? And do you remember what Jesus said? Come and see. So the good catechist always begins with invitation. Come. Because that's what Jesus did. Now, when Jesus said, go... He often had it, go and be converted. He actually, remember, he actually said, go and sin no more. So it wasn't as if we don't deal with the truth. But the timing is so important. If we are going to have victory, if we're going to sway people. So 
we can only imitate Jesus within our own ability. We have to be true to ourselves, as I said in the homily. It's not like Keith Sinatra's. So I have to be in touch with the gifts that I grew up with. I was born in uh, a coal town in the northeast part of Pennsylvania. Now, I'll tell you why I'm telling you this story. You're going to say, oh, my gosh, it's like going on vacation with me. Um, <laughs> I, I, no, I'm, do, I'm doing this because I want you to be thinking, all right, well, what are the gifts that you have? What, what is it that you will need to do to join other people? I'm a social worker, too. And so I understand that if you're ever going to help someone, if you're going to lead someone to the truth, the first thing you have to do is join them. Be one with them. It's the reason I told you the, the thing about the derby. I knew you'd laugh. It, 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 it breaks me. I think it gives you a chance to get to know me. It's not just me getting to know you. It's you getting to know me. It's not just you getting to know the people that you are going to be teaching or catechizing. It's giving them a chance to get to know you, right? That's what accompaniment is about. So, so I was born in a little coal town. It was at, the, at the, the time in which coal was pretty much gone from the northeast part of Pennsylvania, at least the little town of Mahanoy City. It was in the kind of the northeast part of Pennsylvania. I was, okay, I'll admit it, I was the baby in the family. I hope I'm not the only one here. Is there anyone else who's the baby in the family? Oh, thank God. I love it. I love that. I love that. My three, there were three older sisters. I love them. I love my older sisters, and most days, really, they loved me. No, they were already, by the time I was my, by the time I came along, most of my sisters were, uh, were, were already married or in high school, getting ready to get out of, get out of high school. None of, none of my family went to college, so when they got out of high school, they either got a job away from Mahi City, because there were no jobs there. Or, so m most of my time growing up occurred um, with m myself and my older brother. Now, my other, bro my older brother, Georgie, had Down syndrome. Do any of you know anybody who had Down syndrome? Oh, okay, I see a couple of hands. I'm a big, listen, know yourself and know your family. If somebody, if I meet a family where there's a child or an adult with Down syndrome, it's as if I've known them for 50 years. If you have a gift, a particular gift, use it to join other people. This is very important if we are to be instruments of mercy. Huh? So I had a, a brother, my brother Georgie, had Down syndrome. Georgie was uh, five years older than I, and uh, he went to, to grade school more for... Uh, my, my mom would call it discipline, but it was more for what they call today socialization. And our little Slovak school closed when he was in seventh grade and I was in third grade. I went on to another school. He didn't. So that was the, the extent of his, his education. He was very, very smart. I remember when I was in fourth grade, I was worried that he wasn't going to school. So I'd come home and teach him the times tables. I even had some of my buddies teach him. He was very patient with us. But that, that was a good thing. I didn't know that I was being called to be a priest until I was probably in 10th grade. But all of that was God's grace working. Just think back now to the way God's grace was working in you when you were in third grade or fourth grade. That's very important if you're going to be a good catechist because you're going to then understand how God's grace is working in those people you want to serve. I became a priest, as Ron told you, in 1972. My, my dad died in 1977, and my mom died in 1989, and I became legal guardian for my brother, George. One of the best things that ever happened to me. Now, uh, we got to understand that Georgie was the big brother, and if anybody forgot that, he would have a way of remembering. <laughs> there was no doubt about it. He was the big brother. And I must admit that I, and people will say this, that I learned more from my brother George in terms of slowing down, in terms of appreciating people, and you know what else? In terms of meeting people. Georgie would 
would go into a room like this and he would talk to each person. I remember saying to him, George, where did you learn to do that? He said, my mom told me. He says, it's called chit chat. <laughs> he did. I thought, now, now my, my mom was very, very wise. And you have to understand, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. When my mom died in 1989 and we cleaned out that house, George was coming to the rectory to live with me. On my mom's mo mirror was a, a little holy card. And you ever see how holy cards are stuck against the rim of the mirror? And this one must have been pulled out every day because it was well-worn. And you know what it was? A prayer of the mother of a priest for her son. Yeah. Now, I hope you have had a chance to discover someone who has been praying for you. I hope in your life you've had some opportunity, and I hope that if you do it, you discover it in a surprise, that you never knew it. And then you begin to think, oh, I wonder if those things that I thought I was doing such a good job with, you know what I'm talking about? I wonder if that was intercessory prayer. Huh? So I'm telling you all these things so that you can kind of get to, to think, well, now, what are the gifts from my own growing up? And growing up, that some of you have, have problems or things. Uh, your family's perfect. Not my family was not perfect. But it's very important to know your family. And I, I like what, uh, what Jeff said uh, earlier about the importance of us taking responsibility. We're, I'm in the midst as president today of trying, we're trying to come up with a task force to help uh, bishops and dioceses deal with the tremendous amount of violence and lack of civility and lack of respect and, and prejudgments that are being made. But that can only be changed if you and I take that responsibility. That can only be changed in that way. All of this relates to the announcement of the good news of Jesus Christ. So that's a little bit about my family growing up. In 10th grade, I started to go to chapel, and I, I felt God's maybe calling me to, to something more. We were taking all those tests that I think the, the uh, people from, that enter into uh, Franciscan do so well with. And... Um, uh, I thought to myself, well, I don't think I'm called to a career. I, I, I'm not sure what it is, but I feel like I'm called to serve. I think that was the influence of my brother George because my mom all through the time would say, um, now don't forget to take Georgie with you. In other words, when I go out to a ball game or when I play ball or something like that. And that, was, that became part of the integrity. That was the greatest blessing of life. And so think about the blessings there. So th that's the first thing I wanted to say. I know Curtis Martin spoke here, I think, last year, and he makes a distinction of, of the two Spanish words, the difference between saber, which means to know, and conocer, which means to know. And you say, well, no, wait a minute. They both mean to know? Yeah, well, uh, and there's some, some uh, I think I'm just talking to, am I, am I right on that? Okay, but saber, I hate this because there's somebody who, who's an expert in Spanish here. <laughs> she's going to be, I'm not even looking to see if she's smiling or nodding her head while I'm talking. But because uh, mi español is, is muy pobre. Dis disculpame. Um, but saber means kind of to know facts. And when I first started as a catechist, okay, blame me for it concentrated almost completely on knowing the truth of the faith. Was it wrong? No. Was it effective? No. <laughs> Connoisseur means to come to know a person. Very different. If you're going to do saber, you've got to first do connoisseur. That's the key. So when I became a pastor in 1988, I began to take the, the parish pictorial directory with me to my holy hour. Now, I'll admit it, I did it precisely because I thought, well, I'm giving the Lord a, 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 an hour. I don't think he'd mind if I do a little side work for 10 minutes <laughs> and learn, and learn a, few, a few of the names of the parishioners. Well, 
what I didn't realize is that this would become a pattern in my holy hours, that I would give at least 10 minutes to a page every day. It used to be a page of the pictorial directory. You know what I'm talking about by a pictorial directory? The pictorial directory in, uh, in my parish where I was serving. And I was amazed at how much I knew about these people. I was amazed because when you're standing talking to people as they leave church or when you're going on visitation or when you're visiting people in the hospital or when you're part of a catechetical thing and uh, or when especially one of the kids has a problem in the school and you have to meet with the parents, you know, all those, all those things. There's a richness to how much we know. It's amazing how much we know. But when you know it in prayer, when you begin to reflect, you're coming to know the people you're serving more deeply. So in 2007, I met, it was announced that I was going to be going with the Archbishop of Louisville and Archbishop Kelly, whom I'm succeeding. He said to me, um, I want to give you some information about the archdiocese. Is there anything you want? And I said, would you send me the priest pictorial directory? And so every day now, I've been praying one page of priest. Now, I, I can't imagine you wouldn't want to do this if you haven't already. Okay? Just to, to get the group that you're serving and begin to pray by name and by face. Not only are you going to get to know their names and faces, that was my shameful reason for interrupting my prayer, uh, but you're going to find that there's tremendous richness because as you uncover the needs of people, you begin to pray for their richness. And that is coming to Como Sera, to, to know the people so that they can be, they can share with you. Now there's another way that I can explain it. I, I'm, I'm gonna use the example of bowling. How many of you are bowlers? How many of you have gone bowling? Well. I went bowling about three years ago. It was one of these things, people love to have uh, auctions for doing this fill in the blank with the archbishop. So <laughs> it's, it's everything. So, and I don't mind, I like to golf, et cetera, and I'm, I'm, I'm fine with golfing and all, but there was one that was bowling, and I thought, gee, I, I bowled all through grade school and high school. I, I'd be able to bowl. Uh, here's the lesson. If, if, if you haven't bowled for 35 years, sit out the third game. I couldn't move the next day. Well, so, so this is all based on Robert Putnam's book on bowling alone. I don't know if you're familiar, are you familiar with that book? It's a sociological book. It's pretty, it was pretty influential in the late 90s. But he, he did a book on bowling alone and basically what he was saying was people aren't joining societies anymore. Back in the 50s and 60s, everybody was part of a bowling group. Now, nobody's bowling. Uh, one of our priests that I play golf with, Father Tom Gentile, he said to me that in 1973, when he was ordained a priest at a particular country club that he belongs to, it's not, a, it's not a very expensive, I think, truth is known, I think they got the thing free, if I'm not mistaken. But at any rate, he said there were 23 priests who belonged to that country club, and now he's the only one who, bowl, who uh, golfs. So here, but that's not the story I wanted to tell you. It's about uh, what I learned about how to be su a successful bowler. I increased my average from about 155 to about one, let's see, to about um, 240. Here's what you do. The, the alley is about 60 feet long. You walk up the alley. <laughs> you, get, you get to about 15 feet. Or if you want, go closer, go to about eight feet. You will be amazed. You will be amazed at the change in your scores. Now I'm gonna tell you the principle of this is summarized in four words. Error increases with distance. You know when that was first told? At a men's conference. A 
father's times. And there was a story given about fathers who were asked uh, how, how much time they spend with their children. Well, they said, we're pitiful. We probably spend only about 15, 15 minutes a day. They said, would you mind if we strap on a machine so that we can measure it? And they said, sure, no, we'll do that. And you know what they ended up with? The average each day, 39 seconds. 39 seconds. And the most valuable thing that you and I can give to another person is our time. The most valuable thing we can give. It's a commodity because there's only so much of it. So it calls for great priority. But the catechist who does not want to give time to the person with whom they want to have a conversion in Christ is not going to have that great priority. So to be closer, and I, I joking about, don't go home and say, I went up the alley without proper shoes or something like that. Uh, I, I'm using that as an example, but remember the, those four words. Error increases with distance. It doesn't mean that we're perfect when we get closer to people, but it means if we're distant from people, a priest or a pastor who's dis distant from his people, a catechist who really doesn't care about the young people that, that you're, uh, you're, or the whatever age the people are that you're helping to learn, uh, the, the more distant you are, the greater chance of error. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So that's, that's just a little something I wanted to say to you. So the example of, of a catechetical victory uh, is the road to Emmaus. Right? Just think of it. I mean, you know her. I don't have to repeat the story. But you know how uh, Jesus walked with the people. I don't know if he said anything at first, did he? He just walked with the people. He listened to them. What things happened? Are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened these days and ages? He just let them talk. And then they said he started to explain to them the scripture. He, he waited until they were ready to hear. He started to explain to them the scripture. And then, of course, there was the stopping and the breaking of the bread so clearly a sign of the Holy Eucharist. And um, do you remember what they said? Yeah, were not our hearts burning? Boy, wouldn't I like to be that catechist. <laughs> when you left the classroom and, and they said after you finished your session, you know, whatever, they said, oh, oh, were not our hearts burning when we, yeah, that was Jesus. And that's a, basically, he's the one who's teaching us. Um, were not our hearts burning? I think the, the most modern one I'll be talking about at, at the University of, of uh, Notre Dame on Friday. Uh, I have the mass for the ACE program up there, the, the final mass. And you know what, what Friday is? It's the feast of, anybody know? Mary Magdalene. The feast of Mary Magdalene. And now she's the first of the apostles that our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has just raised up the level of that feast day to make it the same as, a, as, a, as one of the tw 12 apostles. So remember her example after the resurrection and Jesus um, appeared to her. Now he must have been reading the, his pictorial directive because <laughs> he said Mary, he said her name. That's all he said. He didn't give any instructions. He, he, he just the name, and then um, he said, Rabboni, teacher. She recognized his voice. She wanted to explain that for another, another sermon, and he said, who am I explaining to now? Uh, he, he, he was going off to, uh, to Galilee with his wounds, by the way. He was going down to Galilee with his, his wounds. And if we want to see Jesus in others, because when she goes to announce Jesus, she announces him risen with his wounds. And so um, that's going to be important for us in whatever level of catechesis, that we, we are, are, are attentive to the wounds of the people we're serving that sometimes block them from understanding. Uh, we've got so much going on in our nation today. So I want to get the, the thing with accompaniment. It's not that 
it's not rock, rocket science, but, but what it is is it's saying to you, um, in order for us to, to teach the truth, and remember uh, St. Uh, Teresa Benedicta of, of the cross from Edith Stein, I don't think I have her, her quote exactly right, but she, I, I think maybe I wrote it down. I did write it down, but I'm a different taker. Uh, <laughs> she said, she said um, uh, do not accept as true anything that is not presented with love. And do not, and do not accept anything as loving that is not presented as truth. She did not ask as truth and love as a multiple choice. Now I wanna, I wanna Concentrate, and I wish I had made copies of, of uh, the uh, Evangelium Nunciandi number 80. How many of you are familiar with Paul VI's uh, apostolic exhortation? No, it was actually, uh, was it an apostolic exhortation or an encyclical? Apostolic exhortation. Am any of you familiar with the apostolic exhortation, right? Uh, Nunci Nunciandi, Ev Evangelium Nunciandi? Uh, I noticed that it was December 8th, 1975, and that was exactly 10 days, excuse me, 10 years after the end of the Second Vatican Council to the point. So it was 10 years after the Second Vatican Council ended, so 40 years ago this last December. So I went back and I read paragraph 80. Paragraph 80 is this page plus another half. These are not small paragraphs. That's why I thought, darn, I should have made a copy for you. But you don't mind if I read a little bit of it, do you? Because it gives you a sense of, if you want to understand Pope Francis, one of the things to be clear of is he rightly says that Evangelium Nunciandi, he thinks is a core document. He thinks it's the best apostolic exhortation ever written. And there have been some good ones, Pastoris Dabagovis, I could go in to a lot of them that, that our Holy Father has written. But let me tell you what he says. First of all, he talks about a lack of fervor. He says, one of the problems we have with catechists is that they have lost their fervor. Do you remember Revelations 2.4? Are you familiar with Revelations 2.4? I'd love to give $50 to the person who knows Revelations 2.4. One time, I see a hand up, no. One time, one time I was in Meade County, it was the 200th anniversary, and I said to somebody, I'd love to give $50 to the person who, uh, I know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to you. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get to you, be patient, be patient. He's, he's got his Bible open, I mean, what do you, uh, I said, I'd love to give $50 to the person who, who knows who the Pope was in, uh, in 1808 when Bardstown came. And a hand went up in the back of church and my heart sank. <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am. She said, Your Excellency, I think it was Pius VII. Who in the world would know that it was Pius VII? So I said to her, well, you, ma'am, you're, you're correct. And you notice I said, I would love to give. <laughs> So I negotiated. I, I was. I went away from that church uh, a twenty dollars lighter. Okay. What? Who has? Who has the answer of? of uh... Go ahead. Shout it out. Say it again. Yeah. It says I hold this against you. I think that's close. That's close. That's. Uh, uh, I don't think I'm going to lose 50 bucks on it, but you, it wasn't. We'll, we'll talk after the session. Um, it's, it, uh, you lost your first laugh, that's exactly right. I hold, I hold this against you. This is the translation I like. I hold this against you. You have less love than you used to. Yeah, that's what our Holy Father back in 1975 said one of the biggest difficulties is a loss of fervor. He said, 
And it is all the more serious because it comes from within. It is manifested in fatigue, disenchantment, compromise, lack of interest, and above all, a lack of joy and hope. This is a good doctrine, isn't it? And then he says that there are insidious things going on. This is after the Second Vatican Council that are almost claiming that we should not teach. He said, too frequently one hears it said in various terms that to impose a truth, be that of the gospel, or to impose a way, be that of salvation, cannot but be a violation of religious liberty. And then he goes on to say, this is, you're gonna wanna read chapter 80. This is a good, 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 or verse 80. Uh, Number 80, he said, it is certainly an error to impose something on the conscience. But then he said, to propose to their consciences the truth of the gospel and salvation in Jesus Christ with complete clarity and with a total respect for the free options which it presents, far from being an attack on religious liberty, fully respects that liberty. In other words, we should not be bashful in being fervent and taking an interest in the person we're catechizing and, and being convinced to share the truth with that person. Now here's the part I wanna read to you especially. It's at the end of it. This is a, this is a, a um, oh hey, I found the, the, uh, the quote on St. Teresa Benedicta. <laughs> All right, here's, here's the quote. Let us therefore persevere, uh, excuse me, preserve our fervor of spirit. Let us preserve the delightful and comforting joy of evangelism, even when it is in tears that we must say. May it mean for us as it did for John the Baptist, for Peter and Paul, for the other disciples, and for the multitude of splendid evangelizers all through the church's history an interior enthusiasm that nobody and nothing can quench, an inside enthusiasm. May it be the great joy of our consecrated lives. And I don't think he means their consecrated lives as in consecrated uh, vocation. I think he's talking about each one of us in baptism is consecrated to the truth. Okay? And may the world of our time which is searching sometimes with anguish, sometimes with hope, be enabled to receive the good news, not from an evangelizer, now here's the part, we do, this is the part we don't wanna do, not from an evangelizer who is dejected, discouraged, impatient, or anxious. Who wants to go out to, on vacation with somebody like that? But from a minister of the gospel whose lives grow with fervor, who have first received the joy of Christ and who are willing to risk their lives so that the kingdom may be proclaimed and the church established in the midst of the world. Now, are you telling me that's not a great paragraph? That's paragraph 80 of Evangelium, uh, uh, Evangelium Nunciandi. Did you wanna hear the exact quote of St. Teresa Benedicta? Do not accept anything as truth if it lacks love, and do not accept anything as love which lacks truth. That's a good, good statement. We desperately need this. How many of you have read the book by David um, Brooks called A Road to Character? It's about, a, it's about a, a two years old or so, year and a half old. Very, very good book. He's a columnist for the New York Times. Uh, he basically is, criticizing our culture, he's saying there are many good things about our culture, but one of the difficult things is that people today think they know everything. They, they're know-it-alls. They're too sure of themselves. And he said, we have so much self-confidence that it's ruining us. We're not listening to each other. We just want to tell each other what we think is the right thing, what our truth is. He said, instead, you don't want so much self-confidence. 
at as much as self-esteem. And self-esteem, he says, means I'm a better person than I used to be. See, self-esteem has a, a, something that involves uh, uh, renewal in, in faith. His name is, is, da is um, uh, David Brooks. He's on C-SPAN. He's on a couple of those Sunday morning programs when you're in church. <laughs> so you can tape them and, 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 and see them. I want to talk about one other hero because I think, how are we doing with our time? Does this mean I have oh, that much left? Okay. No, we're all right. Uh, I'm, I'm delaying because I don't want to have to pay that money back. I mentioned to you in the, in the, in the uh, homily about the book by uh, Servais uh, Pinkares, a, a very good book. It's called The, S the uh, Spirituality of Martyrdom. And his basic point is to say that uh, we've gotten away from the early church's commitment to what a martyr is. He said, Stephen was not a martyr because he gave up his life. He was a martyr because he witnessed in his behavior to Jesus and nothing could stop him. It was the witness to the behavior. So it doesn't take courage as much as it takes humility to be a martyr. And my big hero right now, because of my brother Georgie, is uh, Dr. Jerome Lejeune. How many of you know Dr. Jerome Lejeune? Okay, I see a couple of hands. Let me just tell you quickly who he was. He died in 1994. Now, when he died in 1994, he was uh, from France. He was a, a husband and father, a very faithful husband and father. He loved his family. He was a family doctor. He was also a geneticist. And in 1959, he discovered the cause of Down syndrome. And it was, he called it trisomy 21. If he had called it Lejeune syndrome, you'd all be raising your hands. But he was, he was a humble guy. Uh, he went to San Francisco in 1969, and it was, uh, he was given a, 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 I forget the group that was honoring him, but he was, given a, he was given an award. And he spoke very bravely there. And he spoke about the fact that he, would, he, he, he hopes he, can, he will not regret the discovery he made because he fears that people will begin to take the lives of a child discovered to have Down syndrome in the womb. That's happening terribly today. You know this, I think. Uh, uh, they called it, the people who reported it, called it the two earthquakes that occurred in, in San Francisco that day because there was a little tremor, a literally an earthquake, but then there were his words. He was blackballed so much that he lost a lot of government contracts in France. Uh, he used to do all his research, he would meet with people with Down syndrome and their families every morning, and then he would do his research in the afternoon. And he, he, he called the people he met the disinherited. He said they were the ones that nobody cared about. And um, he probably lost the capacity to get a Nobel Peace, Peace Prize. But he said over and over again, there's only one thing that matters. One and only one thing matters. What have you done for the least of your brother or sister? And that's how he lived his life. Thank God for St. John Paul II because John Paul II recognized him and actually appointed him president of the Pontifical Academy for Life in 1994, just months before he died. He never did have a meeting, but he was appointed the president there. He's also, uh, there's a cause for canonization. He's, he's uh, what's the first letter called? Hmm? Servant, no, servant of, servant, servant of, servant of the Lord. Okay. Um, I hope you will tell real hero stories to the people whom you uh, interact with. Because nobody can touch the hearts of other people like real other people. And we need heroes today. I don't mean that everybody's book ought to become a hero, 
the people who are, there's a lot of faithful people around, I'm sure, in this room. And we need you to tell your story, and we need others to tell their story about things like uh, Dr. Lejeune. We're, we're moving it away from it simply being a debate on life as if people have options. I think we've, we've seen it occur in the United States with the way in which, thank God for the Little Sisters of the Poor, because they have become, I call them, they're the poster child for religious freedom. When people, I was on one day in the morning on Fox and Friends, and in the afternoon I was on um, Wolf Blitzer's situation uh, room, all because of the Little Sisters of the Poor. Because that gets the attention of our culture. We need to talk about real people. So let me give you 14. Looks like, uh, Ron, looks like we're not going to have that question and answer. So if you, you don't mind if I use up all 60 minutes. Okay. So I'm going to give you then one, two, three, four, five, the five things that would be next steps on what, what I think you can do and I can do to help sway someone as you move that person to conversion to the truth and love of Jesus Christ. The first one, to pray for the gift of service. Pray to serve other people. It was C.S. Lewis who, who said that um, when we are in heaven, we will, as we rejoice now whenever we're successful in life here on earth, and we have a success, when we're in heaven, we'll have that same sense of joy when that success happens in the life of another. It's a beautiful way to look at heaven. Pray that you will have that gift here on earth, to be able to serve in such a way that when someone you're serving has had a success, that will fill you with such joy that that joy will be transparent. Joy is not something that you can seek out. It shows up. It's discovered in you. That's the first thing. Secondly, look into your life and your history to find what in your life attracts people. What will people be interested in that leads them more deeply to Jesus Christ? I mentioned to you at the beginning of this, I joked about the, the, the Kentucky Derby, but I mentioned my brother George. When that touched your hearts, many of you, I could see, you need to look and see what are the things that touch your life. Secondly, or thirdly, rather, be humble enough to know that in weakness you will have success. There's a story told it's a true story of a seminarian who on his first day in his apostolic work in a hospital was told to go in and visit Mrs. Murphy. And it says, and by the way, she she's doesn't seem to be in a good mood. So he got all nervous and he went in there and he kicked her bed and he, he somehow stumbled through talking about uh, what, what was the gospel passage for the week and he went out and he thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. I, I was, I got flustered. I was a complete babe. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. So he went back every Thursday, they did this. So he went back the next week and he said, uh, uh, he was all sheepish and he went and the nurse at the nurse's station said, oh, aren't you the one who saw Mrs. Murphy last week? And she said, yeah, yeah, I am. She said, I don't know what you did, but she made a turn for the better. She better now. So he, he kind of filled up this other guy and he, he walked into the room and he saw her and he said, Mrs. Murphy, she smiled at him and uh, he said, you know, I'll be honest with you, when I visited you last week, I thought I was a complete babe. And she said, you were. <laughs> but she said, after you left, I thought to myself, I felt so sorry for you. It's a true story. This really is a true story. And she said, then it dawned on me that was the first time in a month 
that I thought of anybody but myself. In weakness, God is faithful. The fourth thing, there's only five. The fourth thing is in your prayer to exult in the richness of the student you serve. Take enough of an interest that you begin to not just make up compliments that people can see through that, but genuinely see what the gifts are that are in this person that Christ wants to bring to you. I think it was why I mentioned to you for a while the pictorial direction. Find your way of getting to know more deeply and almost preparing yourself to think out of yourself. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a, st a story about Mother, uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, whom you know. They, they used to tell her, uh, people, they'd say, Mother Teresa, you're only this good. Why is it that you can talk to a crowd of 100,000 people? And she said, well, when I was first a sister, I was conscious of my material, what I was going to say. And then she said, I became conscious of the people that I was speaking to. And, and the first thing she said was, no, I was conscious of, of how I looked, actually, was the first thing she said. I was conscious of how I looked. Was my hair straight and all the rest of the stuff? that I look nervous. Then I was conscious of material. Then I was conscious of others. But she said, since I began my holy effort, I now am conscious of God and God's presence in my heart. And it frees us to be conscious because we can just be ourselves and let God direct us. And the final one that I'll mention has to do with the gift of mercy. Mercy does not belong to me or to you. It is lavishly given to us by our merciful Father. Jesus is the one who has constantly reached out through the Gospels and I hope in your life to touch your heart and make you aware of his lavish love and gift to you. It is simply that gift, like St. Mary Magdalene did on the first Easter, that is shared with us. Thank you for being good Catholics.